Hi, I'm Jessica from Tudor Time Machine. Before we start the next episode, I wanted to let you know that we're offering our very first line of Tudor Time Machine merch. So these six items are only available until November 30th. Then they're history. See what I did there? Go to our Facebook page and hit the Shop Now button to see our Tudorific designs, the best pod swag out there. This inaugural offering is 10% off. So don't miss these items that declare your interest and your style. And enjoy this episode of the Tudor Time Machine podcast. Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode 33 of our podcast. Thank you for joining us. If you're new here, it's best to start at episode one. This is a story project, and it goes in order. And if you're enjoying it, wear a t shirt to show your love. Go over to our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. Hit the shop button and decide which swag suits you best. You will look absolutely terrific in it. Tutorific. Tutorific. In our last episode, we saw Philomena and Constance go after that inventory of Wyatt Goods. Now we're off to see Mildred Cecil administer justice among the young gents of Cecil House. After the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jesse. Chapter 33, Cecil House, in which Mildred Cecil averts a duel and wins a round. Her husband had foisted this George Wyatt on her. The fellow's mouth was dry, his tongue thickened, and she could not understand a word. It had already come to her ears that no one liked him, his pomposity mixed with a rat-like wheedling, his too familiar, sorrowful gaze. Mildred pitied him, but not much. Her sister was making noises behind her. Was she crying? She was. At the hands of that Catholic Queen Mary Tudor, the Wyatts lost everything. Anne Bacon moaned. Sir George is a charming young man, the age of my own son. That was true. But her sister never checked her condemnation of girls who happened to be the same age as her own daughter. Mildred would try again to get at exactly what had happened to this Wyatt. Let us bring you a drink, sir, so I may better understand your words. And she watched him, his eyes darting to the ground, to the wall, to the door. He was like a lizard. He drank deeply, sitting before her at the other side of the table, in this, her favourite room. This boy almost spoilt it, his mucus-edged eyes and nose and mouth. The sun should glint from her prisons. Instead, it caught the bodily fluid, making it glint. George Wyatt unspooled his tail. The great Lord William Cecil had gone to much trouble so that he could take the inventory of his family's goods. He had so dreamed of discovering everything the family had lost. Blubbering overtook him for a moment. Arriving at Westminster Hall, the inventory had been removed. George shook his head dramatically. A clerk had told him that it was none other than the Earl of Rutland's pages who had taken it. Mildred was confounded, but she would get to the bottom of the hurly-burly. Rutland was sent for. Mildred well knew he would admit to nothing and laugh about it later. The Earl was intense, quick, and she must admit she had a soft spot for him, yet she had to discipline him so often. If his plots were more veiled, he would avoid being caught. Or perhaps he enjoyed being caught. Many a lad loved to be bad, even her own husband when he was young. Good day, ladies, Rutland bowed. Master Wyatt. George opened his mouth and a torrent of flattery dropped out, until, rather out of nowhere, he snipped. My lord, few people knew I had such an errand to Westminster Hall. You knew, my lord, and you called me away. Rutland was easy. You appeared in my rooms, Wyatt, without my summons, bearing my name. I showed you more manners than you show me now. You called me away and detained me with reading poetry, sir. I played a fine host to you, sir, finer because I hid my displeasure at your calling on me without invitation. You, you, you sent for me to play some prank, sir. I will not tarry here to be spoken so from one so far below me. You will excuse me, ladies." Rutland bowed to Mildred and Anne. Mildred could not argue his cause to leave. 
She shared his affront at George's tone and weasel face, but she always bent towards resolution. I beg you'll remain, my lord. We have not come here to argue, but to set things to right. Now, yesterday, pages of yours were reported at Westminster Hall. I would interview them. Madam, I assure you, no person of my livery was sent. You are a liar, sir. You have done me some trickery, and I will see you punished for it by God. Wyatt exploded. Varlet, dare you call me a liar? Rutland baited. Say it again, sir. Say it again. I will meet you away from the company of these ladies. Break your head, cut your lying dog tongue, and leave you for the grave digger. Liar! Forked! Tongued! Scullion! I I will meet you, sir. With pleasure I will meet you, and smash your face to the ground with the flat of my blade. Hush, hotheads, interjected Mildred. No one will meet. I would not abide such foolishness. Master Wyatt, you may seek your own death, but you will offend God and Her Majesty's order, and you may seek my Lord Rutland's, but that would offend me, and I will not have it. Wyatt threw himself to the floor, wailing that his honour could not brook such sullying. Mildred did not believe Rutland fully innocent. She was sure he was at some joke, but there could be no bloody honour squabble. Sir George retreated to his simpering posture. Where are the lists? he moaned. The lists! Without them I can claim nothing. I will be ruined. The lad was begging and blubbering again. His show of emotions was discomforting. Even her sister, Mildred noticed, was slightly disgusted by it. Take this cloth, boy. Cover your face, Anne Bacon instructed him. George buried his face in the handkerchief. Come, lad, I will order you a horse to carry you back to Gray's Inn. Mildred was impressed by the solicitous manner in which her sister hustled Wyatt out of the room. It was kind and convenient. Now only Rutland remained. Where are Wyatt's papers, sir? My lady, I have them not. I know your word play, my lord. You have them, but perhaps not on your person. Oh, Lady Mildred, will you be my wife? Beauty and razor wit is what I desire most. My lord, you would be more content with a chick who could not see through you. Oh, you are mistaken, madam. Juno fears nothing, even when she sees the mischief of men. You, my lady, are an equally equanimous goddess to meet human mischief with mirth and a firm hand that we may better ourselves. Your tongue, my lord, is an Olympian to twist out such tortured phrases. You overwork the cogs of your brain. You have made too many excuses to me in the past and toil for fresh flattery. Give up and rest well. This I say, sir, if the lists are not returned to the master of the rolls immediately, you shall forfeit amusement and not a little ready money. Rutland bowed. Yes, madam. And I believe a translation of Marcus Aurelius is in order by sundown. Mildred was content as Rutland skulked his way to his chamber. Mildred is a peacemaker here, and we don't have to have a fight to the death over something trivial. You're joking, but these men did that sort of thing. Small slights escalated into a fight that ended in, in someone's death. It's... Unbelievable, really. Of course, it still happens. I mean, a bar fight turns into something crazy now, so. It's true, but dueling, one-on-one -on -one combat, has an incredibly long history, all the way back to the ancient history, Rome and Egypt, too. But wasn't that a different sort of duel where one person from each army fought instead of the entire army? Well, you're right. One-on-one -on -one combat to solve a dispute with just two champions on the battlefield instead of an actual war is an entirely different thing. And that seems like a sort of good idea to me mm -hmm. in comparison. I agree. It also preserves the land and the economy and, you know, stops innocent kind of bystanders being killed. <laughs> Maybe we should go back to that. And since at the time they were sure the gods, or 
God would intervene on the correct side, I think in some ways it was a reasonable solution. Not that we're really advocating one-on-one combat to solve problems. No, no. We are diplomacy advocates. There was also another kind of duel, a judicial duel. This argument between Rutland and George Wyatt is not a matter for the courts to handle. No, the courts weren't that crazy. Judicial duels in the Middle Ages had to have some sort of legal issue that the people involved wanted to have settled. And these duels happened when there was no other way to prove someone's innocence or guilt. So they essentially left it in the hands of the higher power. The judge wasn't going to make a decision. Mm -hmm. But if the crime and the perpetrator was obvious, such as someone stole something and then they had the stolen object, there would be no dueling necessary. The court would just decide. It had to be something that couldn't be proven any other way. A he said, he said. Then they would bring about a judicial duel. That is a state-sanctioned duel that determined guilt or innocence. And that the outcome was determined by a higher power. I mean, in the medieval period, God. Well, in the medieval period in the West. Yes. And sometimes they say fortune, but maybe that was just a leftover. Because they thought the fight was being controlled, that led to disagreement on how the fight should be interpreted. Some people thought the duelers or duelists could take advantage of an opponent's stumble, for instance, because God made the guilty party stumble, or if someone dropped their sword, it was decreed. But other people thought the fight should be fair, and the end was determined by God, and you were cheating by not following the rules. I mean, obviously, also, there were all kinds of ideas about if you were a gentleman, the way you would duel and you would not take advantage of the opponent if they were unintentionally disarmed. And so there's kind of elements of being a gentleman in this. Yes. You as a duelist should allow your opponent to get to their feet if you wanted to play fair and be chivalrous. But technically, you could stab someone who fell or attack if someone was trying to recover his sword if you believed that God made him fall. So if the sword was bent or broken, then the judge would decide whether or not it could be replaced. And if you are afraid of dying, I think there would be a strong incentive to attack the person who had fallen or who had dropped their sword. Yes, of course. Yeah, because judicial duels could be fought to the death. But I think for duels to be judicial and not a brawl, there have to be rules, and those rules have to be honored. True. And the winner could show mercy. If you were losing and the duelist who was winning told you to admit your guilt and you didn't, he was well within his rights to kill you. But you as the duelist could also let him live. These things could go either way. And judges did play an important role. If the fight ended in non-fatal injuries or both duelers died, (laughs) the judge decided the winner and what should be done with the property. Whose widow would get it? (laughs) Oh, the property. Would it go to the aggrieved oldest son or brother or nephew? Or, as you said, it could go to the wife if they specified it or if the circumstances worked out in a certain way. Did you know there are recorded duels between a husband and wife up until the 12th century? Really? And what are they called? Are they domestic duels? No, they were also called judicial duels. And we have a drawing where both husband and wife are naked to the waist and bloody, and they both have swords. Wow. We'll post that picture for you guys to check out. Yes, but then it became illegal in the 1400s for a woman to beat her husband. But not illegal for him to beat her. Wasn't Chaucer's wife of Bath made deaf by her husband's beating, her fifth husband? Oh, poor wife of Bath. Wife beating was sanctioned, and of course it ended the judicial duels between husband and wife because the woman lost all of her power in the eyes of the law. I just don't even know what to think about that. (laughs) No, there's a ridiculous love of single combat, and the most popular kind, and the kind our boys in this chapter would engage in, is the silliest of all, the duel for honor. And these men's honors were very fragile. The tiniest insult would send them into a rage, and then they would demand an honor duel. 
a lot of this idea about dueling was because of this rediscovery of the classical world that, that happened in the Renaissance. And two of the major players in that were Cicero, who was an ancient Roman, and his early Renaissance counterpart, Petrarch, who translated all of Cicero's letters and brought back a lot of the Roman ideals and ideas about the way to live and what, what was of value in life. And Petrarch is so instrumental in the push towards humanism and secularism. Yeah, because before this kind of reintroduction of classical ideas into Western Europe, the ideas about how to behave in the world and with each other and society, they were mainly given by the Catholic Church. And they placed, uh, you know, this high value on personal contemplation. But Cicero and a lot of the ancient Roman thinkers stressed participating in society. That was a Roman value, living an active life. So when all these translations of all these Roman and Greek ideas came back into Western thought, you know, people started changing the way they interacted with each other and the world. As society changed, people are always looking for sort of a popular way to understand that, you know, sort of a a popular an influencer, an, influencer. No, an intellectual influencer. I, I wouldn't say a philosopher, but no, no. Like in business, they always say that that's a thought leader. A thought leader. A thought leader. You're so right. We don't like the word philosopher. Um, so and we don't like the word influencer. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't seem about thought. It seems about the way you dress. So thought leaders in the Renaissance. They wanted to change that emphasis from a life of obedience and contemplation to an active life of public service and participation and being in the world. And Petrarch was considered the new Cicero. And because in every generation, people complain about the young people. <laughs> in Florence, around 1400, men of the old school complained that the young only thought happiness and virtue were bound up with position and reputation in political life. The oldsters knew that the perfect life was one of contemplation and inner peace. So, you know, it's always like this. But I read a book about early Christianity and how it was a reaction against the Roman ideas of civic duty. And the honor duel appeared in Italy with Petrarch and his translations of Cicero's letters. It did, but it took hold in England with the publication of a couple of Italian books. So I cannot speak Italian. I'm going to say Baldessere. Castiglione's Book of the Courtier, which was published in 1528, and also Muzio's Il Dulo. <laughs> that's pretty clear. That's pretty that's clear. About. <laughs> and that was published in 1550. And these books stressed the importance of protecting your reputation. Male toxicity. Isn't that <laughs> what we would call it now? <laughs> Among the rich, or nobility, that is. But I also think there was probably plenty of male toxicity and worrying about your reputation among the lower classes as well. They just maybe didn't duel. I agree. They didn't duel with swords. They dueled with their fists. Yes, so, they yeah. would have a bar like fight. Like people still do. Yes. There was a sense of fairness about the whole situation, though, which was you had to be noble and you could only challenge another noble or a knight, sort of a low noble, to be technical about it. Right. I mean, there was an idea that if you challenge somebody who was, it, that it was unworthy of you to be um, discredited by dishonorable words that might be given to you by a servant, that yes. you shouldn't even take them. They're not even worthy. You're not even going to give them the honor of uh, yes. dueling with you. I mean, a man of a lower rank could challenge one of a higher rank, but the man of higher rank could refuse the duel. He could just say, you're not even worthy of me getting upset about no. Do you think he really could? Or if a lower person challenged them, do you think he would feel like he had to show that he was so much better than the person of lower status? I mean, human nature. I think that when you read literature of the time, and even in the 19th century where they were still, oh my God, were they obsessed with their honor, you know? I think there's a lot of this idea that to honor somebody by fighting a duel with them, you're sort of implying that you guys are on the same level and that even to challenge somebody to a duel was acknowledging their position in your life, that they what they said about you, how they dishonored you, was worthy of being taken seriously because they were of your rank. Yes, so a, a lower person getting involved, in a way it's flattering 
to the person who's lower in society. Right, and you're not going to give them that credit. You right. know, it's the way that we used to, in some military situations, people of lower rank were literally not allowed to fight because fighting was considered honorable. Dying for your country was considered honorable, and people of much lower class weren't worthy of the honor of dying for their country. So I think there's a lot of ideas of violence and combat that are very much tied into being worthy of these what people considered honorable deaths. And there was a certain class that just wasn't considered worthy of that kind of honorable death. Even so, though it's been illegal forever. And even though it was technically illegal to duel for honor in the Tudor period, nobles did it all the time. They were trained in sword fighting and young hotheads. So, of course, they wanted to show themselves off. It's kind of like when you buy a 16-year-old a Maserati and say, you know, go slow. Yes. I mean, it just it's not going to happen. There were people who were dedicated to teaching young gentlemen how to fence. And fencing was incredibly popular. And there were these very, very well-regarded and uh, well-paid fencing masters. And actually, fencing masters charged for their services, and they formed schools of fencing. Actually, they would give out belts, like in karate, to say someone had reached this level or that level. In England, a group was called the English Masters of Defense. And no doubt, the historical Rutland and George Wyatt probably trained with one of these men. Yes, and it was Henry VIII who established the Corporation of the Masters of Defense. Right, so a corporation would have been like a guild, right? Like a guild. Yeah, so there was a guild, the Masters of Defense. Yes, Henry VIII established it as a guild, but Masters of Defense were around long before that. First Master of Defense they have a record of is Master Rogers. So he's in London in 1311 teaching nobles how to duel. Mm -hmm. And of course, there were how-to manuals. We've talked about how much <laughs> the tutors the and the tutors loved how-to manuals. And the tutors loved a how-to manual, <laughs> and there were literally hundreds produced. Fencing was very, very popular, and as men who were not nobles got the idea that they would also like to be able to do it, and they began to practice, and it became more and more popular, and it became like a sport mm -hmm. and a good fencing match could close London for a day and there would be other fights, wrestling. And so then wrestling and dueling began to be incorporated into plays. Right. So it started to appear in the theater. I mean, and think about it. There are so many duels in Shakespeare, serious and funny. Like, I love that comic duel in Twelfth Night. When Sir Toby tricks Viola and Sir Andrew into thinking that the other is a great swordsman, I love that scene. No, oh, that Sir Toby is a troublemaker. But there were stage duels before that. And one of the oldest plays, Robin Hood, has a duel in it. And Robin Hood was performed all the time. And it was performed throughout the 17th century, too. And people just did it. They had the basic story, and then they just did it in the way they wanted to do it. It was popular with strolling players and everything. But, you know, everyone loved a duel in plays. And, I mean, we still love violence in movies, right? And we still love duels. I mean... Look at the movie Princess Bride. That has a great duel. My name is Inigo Montoya. You kill my father. Prepare to die. <laughs> and the actors in that are great stage fighters. All of the playwrights loved a duel. But there were also exhibitions that were just duels. Mm -hmm. And no one knows how to corral spectators like... Burbage, who owned the Globe and partnered with Shakespeare. He had fencing masters produce exhibitions. Which is basically like stage choreography, right? A little bit? Yes. Yeah. Burbage would produce whatever people would watch, you know? On one hand, he was doing fights. On the other hand, he was doing theater. I mean, he, he had his hand in everything. But honor dueling thrived in England for hundreds of years. I mean, and just as you said, the last recorded duel in England was in 1852. I mean, I read a lot of 19th century novels. <laughs> and if people want to duel in England, they go to the continent and duel. They go for the day and have a duel, and whoever survives comes back. That's what they would do. They, it wasn't as if people stopped challenging each yeah. other to duels. In the U.S., Andrew Jackson still dueled, right? It, and, of course, An Alexander Hamilton died in a duel. It just 
I don't know. It seems so crazy. It's weird to think that all this dueling was inspired by... And translating Cicero. <laughs> oh, dear. Perhaps it would have been better if they hadn't. But you know what? People would have found a reason to kill each other. So it, it doesn't matter. We can't lay it on no, Cicero. No, we can't lay it on Cicero. Translating was a very democratic thing, actually, because it meant that people who didn't read Latin, who weren't educated that highly in Latin, could could read these great Roman thinkers. So if you could read English and translate these important texts, you could share them with anyone that could read. And these translated books, they were a kind of, uh, you know, seven habits of highly effective people. And they call that the most influential book of the 20th century. Which I have not read. I actually have not read it either. Apparently, it's about controlling your own destiny and doing well in business. It's a way many people think about things. This individualism that is part of the seven habits of highly effective people, <laughs> it's actually beginning in this period that we're talking about. It's a very humanist idea that everyone should have access to information and that everyone should be able to read the primary source, the Bible, for example. But can you imagine for years and years and years, people sat in church and they just had no idea what was happening? Even the idea that you talked to a priest to get to God, I mean, you weren't worthy of going straight to the big man, you know? So it, it's its really a profound change in the way people were thinking about things. Or, or, maybe, or maybe you could talk to a saint. Right, you had to have somebody intercede for you. Then they spoke to God for you. It's, I don't know, it, the Catholic Church is weirdly bureaucratic. And so hierarchical. Right. Well, and that brings us back to good old Erasmus, who was huge humanist and just so influential in terms of education and thought in this period. He was a huge believer in self-improvement and that you had to be able to read and study original texts for yourself to better yourself. I mean, it was great to read it in your own language, but really in order to really understand it, you had to go back to the original. So translation and language were really a cornerstone of an excellent education at this time period. Right, and Erasmus was definitely a Christian, so he thought you should learn all of the biblical languages, which were Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. But one of the most famous tutors of the tutors... Uh-huh. <laughs> Isn't that a fave phrase we say about everybody? Yeah. <laughs> was like, she was the most beautiful at court, really. But Roger Ascham really was all about the Latin. Right, and Ro Roger Ascham wrote his schoolmaster in 1570, and he describes this idea of double translation as the most important educational technique for youth, an exercise which would both make the pupils fine speakers but also help them think clearly. And what is double translation, you may ask? So it's interesting because they always talk about Elizabeth and Mary and Edward Edward yeah. doing translations. But I always wondered, are they translating out of Latin or into Latin? And the answer is both, mm -hmm. because they do a double translation. The student translates a passage into the language they are learning, Latin or Hebrew, and then the teacher corrects the student's translation. And then... You take a little break, and then you look at those words, and you translate them back into the original language so that you see, so that you understand how you would understand those words if you were putting them back into another mm -hmm. language. It does seem very rigorous, a real intellectual exercise. It does. Questioning the text you're reading and what would best describe that, and then what Latin you would choose to say what you have translated. It's very hard. Roger Ascham was an early critical thinker. And he was Elizabeth I's tutor, as well as many other royal children. And it shows that just because they were royal and being educated in a one-on-one -on -one way, it wasn't a cushy situation. Like, things were expected of them. Oh, yeah. And that's evidenced by how incredibly well-versed they all were in languages. I mean, Elizabeth, of course, loved languages and had her ladies-in-waiting do translations. Mm -hmm. We have some of Elizabeth's translations, and we still talk about critical thinking in education all the time. But in the next episode, it's back to bureaucracy. We're catching up with Philomena and Constance to see what is in the inventory of Wyatt's possessions. Will they finally find the relic? You'll have to listen to find out. 
And leave us a comment on Tudor Time Machine Facebook. There's always a lively discussion. And while you're there, check out our swank merch. Announce your interest. Get the Do You Tudor Tea. <laughs> it's so fun, and we would really appreciate your support. And tune in next time for more Times Riddle and more Tudor-minded talk. Thank you.